Madam President, the theme of the 73rd session of the General Assembly, making the United Nations relevant to all people, global leadership, and shared responsibilities for peaceful, equitable, and sustainable societies remains true to the aspiration of our founding fathers. The theme is most relevant and timely. It is especially pertinent in the context of the new Malaysia. The new government of Malaysia, recently empowered with a strong mandate from its people, is committed to ensure that every Malaysian has an equitable share in the prosperity and wealth of the nation. A new Malaysia emerged after the 14th general election in May this year. Malaysians decided to change their government, which had been in power for 61 years, that is, since independence. We did this because the immediate past government indulged in the politics of hatred, of racial and religious bigotry, as well as widespread corruption. The process of change was achieved democrati democratically without violence or loss of lives. Malaysians want a new Malaysia that upholds the principles of fairness, good governance, integrity, and the rule of law. They want a Malaysia that is a friend to all and enemy of none. A Malaysia that remains neutral and non-aligned. A Malaysia that dissests and abhors wars and violence. They also want a Malaysia that will speak its mind on what is right and wrong without fear or favor. A new Malaysia that believes in cooperation based on mutual respect for mutual gains. The new Malaysia that offers a partnership based on our philosophy of prosper thy neighbor. We believe in the goodness of cooperation that a prosperous and stable neighbor would contribute to our own prosperity and stability. The new Malaysia will firmly espouse the principles promoted by the UN in our international engagements. These include the principles of truth, human rights, the rule of law, justice, fairness, responsibility and accountability, as well as sustainability. It is within this context that the new government of Malaysia has pledged to ratify all remaining core UN instruments related to the protection of human rights. It will not be easy for us because Malaysia is a multi-ethnic, multi-religious, multi multicultural and multilingual country. We will accord space and time for all to deliberate and to decide freely based on democracy. Madam President, when I last spoke here in 2003, I lamented how the world had lost its way. I bemoaned the fact that small countries continued to be at the mercy of the powerful. I argued the need for de the developing, developing world to push for reform, to enhance capacity building and diversify the economy. We need to maintain control of our own destinies. But today, 15 years later, the world has not changed very much. If at all, the world is far worse than 15 years ago. Today, the world is in a state of turmoil, economically, socially, and politically. There is a trade war going on between the two most powerful nations. 
and the rest of the world is feeling the pain. Socially new values undermine the stability of nations and their people. Freedom has led to the negation of the concept of marriage and families, of moral codes, of respect for each other. But the worst turmoil is in the political arena. We are seeing acts of terror everywhere. People are tying bombs to their bodies and blowing them, blowing them up in crowded places. Drugs are driven into holiday crowds. Wars are fought and people beheaded with short knives. Acts of brutality and are broadcast to the world live. Masses of people risk themselves, their lives, to migrate only to be denied asylum, sleeping in the open and freezing to death. Thousands starve and tens of thousands die in epidemics of cholera. No one, no country is safe. Security checks inconvenience travelers. No liquids on plane. The slightest suspicion leads to detention and unpleasant questioning. To fight the terrorists, all kinds of security measures, all kinds of gadgets and equipment are employed. Big Brother is watching, but the facts of terror remain. The acts of terror remain. Malaysia fought the bandits and the terrorists at independence and defeated them. We did use the military, but alongside and more importantly, we campaigned to win the hearts and minds of these people. This present war against the terrorists will not end until the root causes are found and removed from and the hearts and minds are one. What are the root causes? In 1948, Palestinian land was seized to form the state of Israel. The Palestinians were massacred and forced to leave their land. Their homes and farms were seized. They tried to fight the conventional war with help from sympathetic neighbors. The friends of Israel ensured this attempt failed. More Palestinian land was seized and Israeli settlements were built on more and more Palestinian land and the Palestinians themselves are denied access to, the, to these settlements built on their land. The Palestinians initially tried to fight with catapults and stones they were shot with live bullets and arrested. Thousands are incarcerated. Frustrated and angry, unable to fight a conventional war, the Palestinians resort to what we call terrorism. The world does not care even when Israel breaks international laws, seizing ships carrying medicine, food and building materials in international waters. The Palestinians fired ineffective rockets which hurt no one. Massive retaliations were mounted by Israel, rocketing and bombing hospitals, schools and other buildings, killing innocent civilians, including school children and hospital patients, and more. The world reward Israel deliberately by deliberately provoking Palestine by recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. It is the anger and frustration of the Palestinians and their sympathizers that caused them to resort to what we call terrorism. But it is important to acknowledge that any act which terrify people also constitute terrorism and states dropping bombs on or launching rockets which maim and kill innocent people 
also terrify people. These are also acts of terrorism. Malaysia hates terrorism. We will fight them. But we believe that the only way to fight terrorism is to remove the cause. Let the Palestinians return to reclaim their land. Let there be a state of Palestine. Let there be justice and the rule of law. Warring against them will not stop terrorism, nor will out-terrorizing them succeed. We need to remind ourselves that the United Nations organization, like the lead of League of Nations before, was conceived for the noble purpose of ending wars between nations. Wars are about killing people. Modern wars are about mass killings and total destruction countrywide. Civilized nations claim that they abhor killings for any reason. When a man, a man kills, he, he commits the crime of murder and the punishment may be death. But wars, we all know, encourage and legitimize killings. Indeed, the killings are regarded as noble and the killers are hailed as heroes. They get medals stuck to their chest and statues erected in their honor, have their names mentioned in history books. There is something wrong about our way of thinking with our value system. Kill one man, it is murder. Kill a million and you become a hero. And so we still believe that conflicts between nations can be resolved with war. And because we still do, we must prepare for war. The old adage says, to have peace, prepare for war. And we are forever preparing for war, inventing more and more destructive weapons. We now have nuclear bombs capable of destroying whole cities. But now we know that the radiation, radiation emanating from the explosion will affect even the country which uses the bomb. A nuclear war would destroy the world. The fear, this fear has caused the countries of Europe and North America to maintain peace for over 70 years. But that is not for other countries. Wars in these countries, in these other countries, can help life test the new weapons being invented. And so they sell them to warring countries. We see their arms in wars between smaller nations. These are not world wars, but they are no less destructive. Hundreds of thousands of people have been killed, whole countries devastated, and nations bankrupted because of these fan fantastic new weapons. But these wars give handsome dividends to the arms manufacturers and the traders. The arms business is now the biggest business in the world. The profit, sh they profit shamelessly from the death and destruction they cause. Indeed, so-called peace-loving nations often promote this shameful business. Today's weapons cost millions. Fight, fighter jets cost about a hundred million dollars, and maintaining them costs costs as much as mil, mil, tens of million. But the poor countries are pressured, persuaded to buy them even if they cannot afford. They are told that then their neighbors or their enemies have them. It is therefore imperative that they too have these weapons. So, while the people starve and suffer from all kinds of deprivations, a huge percentage of their budget is allocated to the purchase of modern arms. 
that they are biased may never have to use the bo them bothers the purveyors not at all. Madam President, in Myanmar, Muslims in Rak Rakhine State are being murdered. Their homes torch and millions of refugees had to flee force had been forced to flee to drown in the high seas to live in makeshift huts without water or food without the most primitive sanitation yet the authorities of Myanmar including a Nobel Peace Laureate deny that this is happening I believe in non-interference in the internal affairs of nations. But does the world watch massacres being carried out and do nothing? Nations are in, independent. But does this mean that they have a right to massacre their own people because they are independent? Madam President, on the other hand, in terms of trade, the nations are no longer independent. Free trade means no protection by small countries of their infant industries. They must abandon tariff restrictions and open their countries to invasion by the products of the rich and the powerful. Yet the people, the simple products of the poor are subjected to clever barriers so, so that they cannot penetrate the markets of the rich. Malaysian palm oil is labelled as dangerous to health and the estates of these palm oil trees are destroying the habitat of animals. Food products of the rich declare that they are palm oil free. Now palm diesel are also condemned because they are decimating virgin jungles. These caring people forget that their boycott is depriving hundreds of thousands of people from jobs and a decent life. We in Malaysia, we care for the environment. Some 48% of our country remains virgin jungle. Can our detractors come claim the same for their own countries. Madam President, Malaysia is committed to sustainable development. We have taken steps, for example, in improving production methods to ensure that our palm oil production is sustainable. By December 2019, the Malaysian Sustainable Palm Oil Standard will become mandatory. This will ensure that every drop of palm oil produced in Malaysia will be certified sustainable by 2020. Madam President, all around the world, we observe a dangerous trend to inward-looking nationalism of governments pandering to populism, populism, retreating from international collaborations and shutting their borders to free movements of people, goods and services, even as they talk of a borderless world of free trade. While globalization has indeed brought us some benefits, the impacts have proven to be threatening to the independence of small nations. We cannot even talk or move around without having our voices and movement recorded and often used against us. Data on everyone is captured and traded by powerful nations and their corporations. Malaysia lauds the UN in its endeavours to end poverty, protect our planet and try to ensure everyone enjoys peace and prosperity. But I would like to refer to the need for reform in this organization. 
five countries on the basis of their victories in wars fought 70 years ago cannot claim to have a right to hold the world to ransom forever. They cannot take the high moral ground, uh, the moral high ground, preaching democracy and regime change in the countries of the world when they deny democracy in this organization. I had suggested that the veto should not be by just one permanent member, but by at least two powers backed by three non-permanent members of the Security Council. The General Assembly should then back the decision with a simple majority. I will not say any more. I must admit that the world without the UN would be disastrous. We need the UN. We need to sustain it with sufficient funds. No one should, th should threaten it with financial deprivation. Madam President, after 15 years and at 93, I return to this podium with the heavy task of bringing the voice and hopes of the new Malaysia to the world stage. The people of Malaysia, proud of their recent democratic ach achievements, have high hopes that around the world we will see peace, progress and prosperity. In this, we look, we look towards the United Nations to hear our pleas. I thank you, Madam President. On behalf of the General Assembly, I wish to thank the Prime Minister of Malaysia for his statement and I request protocol to escort His Excellency.